Tonight's broadcast is going to be an archive program, specifically a supplement to the six-part Radio Free America series dealing with the Iran-Contra scandal. For the record, those programs are Radio Free America shows 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, and 34. 34 has at least, it has in fact two supplements already. This will, rep will represent a third supplement to Radio Free America number 34. It will be included under the title, The December Surprise, The Politics of Terror and the Exoneration of the Secret Team. Now, for the people who eventually hear this program on tape or on another radio station, today is January 8, 1989, and I'm broadcasting from the southern part of the San Francisco Bay Area. At this precise point in time, and it's exactly 7.15, according to the clock here in the studio, much of the Bay Area is currently uh, celebrating the San Francisco 49ers' re recent victory over the Chicago Bears, this sending them to the Super Bowl. The red and gold clad faithful of the San Francisco 49ers are by now foaming at the mouth and biting the tires and otherwise expressing their jubilation over the victory of the 49ers over the much hated and feared Chicago Bears of the NFL. Now I myself am a sports fan, however, uh, I learned some time ago to take professional sports with a generous grain of salt, and I thought by way of easing into the subject material of tonight's broadcast, we might uh, take a look at some links between what most people are thinking about, at least here in the Bay Area, and what most people ought to be thinking about, not only here in the Bay Area, but all over the country. It'll seem perhaps as if I'm striving here to make a point. Stick with me here. Obviously, this first, this intro to the program here is a bit uh, tongue-in-cheek, perhaps a bit lighter than what we're going to get into later, but stick with me. I think you'll find that although most people are thinking about deniners, in fact, there are connections between deniners, which is what they are thinking about, and a whole lot of other things, which is what they should be, but tragically are not thinking about. Reading an article now from the San Francisco Chronicle of Tuesday, December 6th of 1988. An article by David Dietz and Bill Wallace of the Chronicle staff. It's headlined, Drug Suspect Linked to Jail Teamster. A suspect in the international drug ring that was broken up last week has had ties with Rudy Tam, last name T-H-A-M, a former Bay Area Teamsters official who has been linked to organized crime figures. According to law enforcement and other sources, Sergio Marangi, M-A-R-A-N-G-H-I, who is in custody for alleged drug trafficking, shared a South San Francisco suite of offices with Tam as recently as 1985. A source described Tam yesterday as a silent partner, unquote, in Marangi's import business. Tam, 65, was convicted in 1980 for embezzling $3,000 in Teamsters funds. He is now back in prison for violating parole, largely for consorting with Jimmy the Weasel Fratiano, a self-described killer for organized crime. Last name, by the way, of Mr. Fratiano, F-R-A-T-I-A-N-N-O. Morangi was arrested last week as the alleged local head of an international ring with mafia ties that smuggled heroin and cocaine into the United States. Well, in a nutshell, this mafia ring, mafia-connected ring, which was allegedly smuggling heroin and cocaine into the United States, is yet another outgrowth of something that we've been talking about for many years here on One Step Beyond, and that a uh, close colleague and recently departed friend, Mae Brussel, had been talking about for many, many years on her World Watchers program, namely the Pizza Connection case. Now, the Pizza Connection case is enormous in scope. We're going to get into it at considerable length and detail this evening, Suffice it to say that the bust, which was, is referred to in that article, involves the Pizza Connection case in which heroin and cocaine were being distributed from pizza restaurants by organized crime in this country, at least allegedly so. And uh, Jimmy the Weasel Fratiano, associate of Rudy Tam, allegedly an associate and perhaps even partner in crime, at least according to the allegations contained in that article, of Sergio Morangi, one of the accused in this case, Jimmy the Weasel Fratiano touches a number of different bases. Although perhaps sideline markers or goal lines would be a more appropriate uh, sports metaphor given the football tone of the Bay Area this evening and uh, a metaphor which I'm going to introduce later in the broadcast or very shortly, actually. Reading now from a book called The Last Mafioso, 
That's authored by Ovid DeMaris, capital D-E, capital M-A-R-I-S. That book was published in hardcover by New York Times Books and copyrighted in 1981. And of uh, the subject of the book, Jimmy the Weasel Fratiano, referred to in that article, the self-described mafia killer, uh, there's an interesting section in here when Fratiano was beginning to cooperate with federal authorities and he was working as a federal informer. Now, this particular section of The Last Mafioso refers to a telephone wiretap by the authorities, this in connection with a drug deal that was allegedly being set up by Jimmy the Weasel Fratiano. I'm just going to read you a very short section of this, make of it what you will. I'm not uh, emphasizing any conclusions, but I think certainly it uh, gives us an indication that there are perhaps... Uh, more important things to be thinking about than the Niners, and that perhaps uh, the milieu which touches on some of our lighter, more entertaining, or some of the lighter and more entertaining aspects of our environment also deals with some of the less entertaining and more frightening aspects of our environment. Reading from The Last Mafioso by, Jimmy the, by uh, Ovid DeMaris in cooperation with Jimmy the Weasel Fratiano, a wiretap here of a proposed drug sting helping that, that Jimmy the Weasel was helping to set up. Uh, the two people heard uh, speaking with Jimmy the Weasel here are two organized crime associates of his, as described in the book, Billy Marchando, M-A-R-C-H-I-O-N-D-O, and Sal Amarena, A-M-A-R-E-N-A. -A. Part of the wiretap, this from 2 p.m. on September 9th of 1977, according to the record here, Amarena, we all shoot over here. We got some nice company here. Here's Jimmy. Jimmy, this being Jimmy the Weasel Fratiano. Hello, what's doing? You get the sausage, unquote? Marciando. Yep, came in yesterday. Thank you. Jimmy. Hey, don't forget now. When the Miami Dolphins play, you're going to come over here. See, I got it arranged, so you're going to sit with this guy, and then in parentheses explaining who this guy is, Eddie D. Bartola, owner of the 49ers. Marciando. Well, I want to talk with this guy, but that's a bad time for me to leave. Jimmy, that's when they play. How's the briquettes coming? Marchando, terrific. Sold all we could make. That passage once again. Amorain, you well shoot over here. We got some nice company here. Here's Jimmy. Jimmy, hello, what's doing? You get the sausage? Marchando, yeah, came in yesterday. Thank you. Jimmy, hey, don't forget now, when the Miami Dolphins play... You're going to come over here. See, I got it arranged, so you're going to sit with this guy, Eddie D. Bartola, owner of the 49ers. Marchando, well, I want to talk with this guy, but that's a bad time for me to leave. Jimmy, that's when they play. How's the briquettes coming? Marchando, terrific. Sold all we could make. Well, uh, who knows? I don't want to make too much of this, but I suspect that perhaps uh, there's more being discussed here than simply sausage and briquettes. I suspect those words may uh, have more, por more portent than their literal meanings. Uh, one wonders if the briquettes were going to be used for uh, tailgate parties or whatever. And uh, the point being here that uh, enjoy football. I, I get a kick out of it myself. But uh, don't be too surprised when the Niners beat the spread as they did today by, what, 26 points? Something like that? Anyway. By way of pointing out uh, only that there are the world we live in has a lighter side, as exemplified by the Niners, and it has a darker side, as exemplified by what we're about to look at. We're talking about a number of things this evening. We just uh, finished with a slightly tongue-in-cheek uh, look at some of the associates of Jimmy the Weasel Fratiano, self-confessed uh, mafia hitman and eventually federal informer. Among the people that uh, hook up with the circle of friends surrounding Jimmy the Weasel Fratiano is an accused heroin smuggler named Sergio Morandi, who was connected, who has been accused in connection with the recent Pizza Connection heroin and cocaine smuggling case. Says there are about four Pizza Connection cases or related cases, and it appears really that uh, they're all part of the same case. And we're going to take a look at uh, a number of interesting things, not only dealing with the Pizza Connection case with which there are more connections than a switchboard, as I like to say. We're also going to take a look at the Iran-Contra scandal, and we're going to take a look at some interesting maneuvering, which I think 
connects a number of different events. The plane crash in Mexico, which killed Israeli counter-terrorist expert and Oliver North and George Bush associate Amiram Nir, last name N-I-R. The recent tragic terrorist bombing and plane crash, which downed an airliner with 200-plus people over Lockerbie, Scotland, or maybe it was 150, I forgot. I think it was 250, the exact death toll uh, case. I think it was 258 now that I think about it. That is going to be connected up, I believe, and in fact, I think it does connect up in a way that I hope to illustrate here with the Iran-Contra scandal. If these connections are not hard and fast, I certainly think they need to be investigated. And again, I'm going to be presenting a working hypothesis this evening, which I believe, which I believe links this recent heroin smuggling bust and the two plane crashes, the one of Amiram Nir, the Lockerbie plane crash, the recent dismissal of conspiracy charges against Oliver North, the recent dismissal of weapon smuggling charges against some other people related to the Iran-Contra scandal, and perhaps also the recent attack on a couple of Libyan aircraft in the Gulf of Sidra off the coast of Libya. The first part of the broadcast that we're going to deal with, uh, and then we, were going to, we will take a musical break before proceeding, is going to involve an examination, first of all, of the latest pizza case connection bust. We're going to take a look at that uh, bust, which occurred on December 2nd, or was announced, I should say, on December 2nd of, the, of uh, 1988, we're going to take a look at that. We're also going to take a look at another article, two more articles, in fact, which appeared in the popular press that very same day. First of all, an article announcing the plane crash and resultant death of Amiram Nir, a former Israeli or an Israeli counter-terrorist expert, as I said. That very same day, the very same day that this fourth pizza connection bust was, connected, was announced, the very same day that Amiram Nir's plane went down, President Reagan announced that he not only would not pardon Oliver North, but he would not release secret documents that Oliver North had requested for his defense. That uh, ultimately resulted in Oliver North's having conspiracy charges dismissed against him by Special Prosecutor Lawrence Walsh. And again, what a very special prosecutor Lawrence Walsh, Lawrence Walsh is, we looked at in Radio Free America number 34, the fourth and concluding program about the Iran-Contra scandal, in which we looked at Prosecutor Lawrence Walsh's long-time affiliation with mainstream Republican Party and former President Richard Nixon of Watergate fame in particular. It's not surprising that uh, this prosecutor should not pursue a Republican, a seated Republican administration as vigorously as he otherwise might have. We're going to take a look at an article which emerged on December 4th. The article's announcing the fourth pizza connection connected bust, the article announcing the Amaram near plane crash, and the article announcing that Reagan would not release government documents requested by Oliver North all hit the press on December 2nd. Two days later, a very important story was floated in the Washington Post and quickly picked up by other papers in which it was disclosed that Oliver North and Amiram Nir had been the two focal points of a joint U.S.-Israeli counter-terrorist program in calendar years 1985 and 86. That counter-terrorist program inevitably touched on many aspects of the highly complex Iran-Contra scandal. And we're going to take a look at the possible significance of this disclosure on December 4th of 1988. That's what we're going to look at in this section. We will then take a break, and I will run down, before proceeding into the next section, what we're going to talk about in that section as well. At the end of the broadcast tonight, I will do a recap, because it's a very complex and yet a very important scenario that we're detailing this evening. The first article that I'm going to read comes from the New York Times of Friday, December 2nd of 1988. And as you watch how many things happened in December of 1988 and early January of 1989, I think you'll see why I call this program the December Surprise, the politics of terror and the exoneration of the secret team. The secret team, by the way, being a popular name which, by which many of the alleged conspirators in the Iran-Contra scandal have come to be known since the allegations contained in the very well-known by this time Christic Institute suit, the Christic Institute being a public interest law firm which has undertaken litigation against many of these characters uh, on behalf of Tony Avergan and Martha Honey, two journalists wounded in a terrorist bombing in La Penca, 1980, that's in Costa Rica, 1984. By the way, before getting into the first part of the broadcast, I think I'm going to, to take time to introduce 
uh, a metaphor which represents a very important part of the working hypothesis that I'm going to be presenting for your examination this evening. Now, recalling again the somewhat tongue-in-cheek football orientation, or, or introduction, I should say, that I gave at the beginning of the broadcast, since football is on people's minds and since uh, there are at least uh, some very, very superficial connections between the people involved in uh, the pizza connection case and uh, the owner of the Niners, Eddie D. Bartola, I think it might be interesting to talk about uh, a metaphor which I think, I think, will help shed some light on many of the machinations that I think underlie some of the events in the news over the last six weeks. Now, in football, something which Joe Montana of the 49ers has learned to use to great effect is something called the play-action pass. Now, again, I'm not trying to be patronizing for the benefit of people that are football fans, but for those many of you who are not, and we do have a lot of people who could give a rat's tail about football, uh, a play-action pass is, wi is one in which the quarterback fakes a handoff to the running back. He fakes a running play in order to freeze the linebackers because the linebackers have to remain stationary in anticipation of backing up the line during a running play and plugging any resulting holes through which a ball carrier might run. They are frozen for a period of time. They are not free to react with the alacrity that they might otherwise have to a pass play. Now, theoretically, because the linebackers have been frozen by the play action, the fake run, this gives the pass receivers time to get behind their designated coverers, and theoretically the quarterback then hits the pass receiver for a long gainer. Well, we're going to be taking a look this evening at a number of different things which I think, and again, I'm presenting this working hypothesis for your examination, which I think may very well be understood by the play action pass. I think if we, in our metaphor, think of many of the key players and potential players in the Iran-Contra scandal and any resulting prosecutions as linebackers, okay, if we think of key players in the Iran-Contra scandal or potential key players in the Iran-Contra scandal as linebackers, then I think we can look at some of the machinations which I'm going to detail this evening as, among other things, as among other things, being designed to freeze these linebackers, to freeze these linebackers in such a way as they will not be able to react to the long-gaining plays, which in my opinion may very well have been instigated by the secret team or elements thereof. So again, play-action pass freezes the linebackers, and I think we're going to be looking at some things this evening which could be thought of as play-action passes, and if we think of key players in the Iran-Contra scandal as linebackers, I think we're going to see how a lot of them are altogether frozen, at least for the time being, and how the, that freezing has influenced the prosecution or alleged prosecution of Oliver North and company. Now again, the first article I'm going to read comes from the New York Times of Friday, December 2nd of 1988. And again, we're talking about the December surprise. Three important stories beginning all appearing in the popular press on Friday, December 2nd of 1988. The first story details what, or announces, I should say, what for practical purposes we're going to call Pizza Connection 4. Now, it should be stated that it is my opinion, and it has been the working hypothesis here on this broadcast for some time, that in fact all of the Pizza Connection cases are in fact one, but until that can be positively established, we're going to call them Pizza Connections 1 through 4, number 4 being announced, as I said, by, among others, the New York Times on Friday, December 2nd of 1988. This is an article by Ralph Blumenthal of the New York Times. It's headlined, Dozens Seized in New U.S.-Italian Anti-Drug Sweep. In the year's second major joint sweep by the American and Italian authorities against Sicilian mafia drug rings operating in the United States, federal officials yesterday announced the arrest of 52 people suspected of heroin and cocaine trafficking around the country. Among the innovative plots used in the trafficking, they said, were schemes to smuggle in drugs in shipments of wine and roses. Twenty-three other suspects were being sought nationwide in what William S. Sessions, director of the Federal Bureau of Investigations, called a successful drive on top leaders, unquote, of organized crime. The simultaneous arrests and searches took place in New York, Buffalo, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Florida, Illinois, and California. 
The Italian authorities in related raids seized at least 22 of 133 others charged with narcotics violations. The joint effort came eight months after the American and Italian authorities launched what was described last March as the biggest cooperative drug case ever mounted by the two nations against 233 alleged traffickers, 25 more than the number named in charges yesterday. Both operations grew out of the so-called Pizza Connection investigation that culminated in 1984. Because 15 of those charged in the March case are currently on trial in Federal, Dis federal District Court in Manhattan, the judge in that case took the unusual step of ordering the government under threat of contempt not to make any reference to the Pizza Connection or to name any of those on trial in its announcement of charges yesterday. Rudolph W. Giuliani, G-I-U-L-I-A-N-I, -I, the United States attorney against whom Judge John E. Spritzo specifically directed his order, complied, saying at a news conference that the latest case stands on its own, unquote. Yet extensive court papers released yesterday show how the new charges had grown out of earlier investigations, including the pizza case, which took its name from the pizzerias used as heroin smuggling fronts. Skipping down in the article... Among those arrested at the cafe, the FBI said, was its owner, Giuseppe Gambino, 42 years old, of Staten Island. He was identified by the, by the Bureau as a member of the Gambino crime family and a nephew of Carlo Gambino, who gave his name to the Klan and served as boss of bosses in New York until his death in 1976. According to a 153-page sworn rider to search warrants that the FBI filed with the court and that were released yesterday... Giuseppe Gambino, along with his older brother Giovanni, is a fugitive from an Italian conviction for heroin trafficking and mafia association. Both were acquitted in a 1984 New Jersey drug case in which their brother, Rosario, was convicted and sentenced to 45 years in prison. Giovanni Gambino was not charged yesterday, but was nonetheless described in the court affidavit as the current leader of the Brooklyn-based Sicilian faction of the Gambino family. Unquote. Well, the Pizza Connection case, and here we're looking at something called Pizza Connection 4, or which we will dub Pizza Connection 4 for the time being, touches a great, great many different bases, including, in a number of different respects, the Iran-Contra scandal. First of all, let me detail the Pizza Connection case somewhat more thoroughly than I have to date, or uh, up to this point in the broadcast. In 1984, as indicated in the text of that article, a major drug smuggling investigation came to a head. Now, this drug smuggling investigation was of a mafia heroin, and as we have come to see, also a cocaine smuggling operation, which took place both in Europe, through Italy, and in the United States. It is called the Pizza Connection case because the main participants in this case were the, the main... Uh, organized crime conspirators were moving their product, their drugs, through pizza restaurants in the United States, primarily in the, the Northeast and Midwest. The proceeds from this mafia smuggling case were being laundered through two major U.S. brokerage houses. Those brokerage houses are E.F. Hutton and Merrill Lynch, Pierce, Fenner, and Smith. Now, the head of E.F. Hutton's division through which this was being done for at least part of the time that the Pizza Connection case was going on was a fellow named Scott Pierce. Scott Pierce is George Bush's brother-in-law. Now, the head of Merrill Lynch, for much of the time that uh, Merrill Lynch was laundering some of the Pizza Connection money, was Donald Reagan, up until a couple of years ago, White House Chief of Staff, and in that position for most of the Reagan administration. The Pizza Connection case is notable for a number of other interesting connections. Perhaps most significantly, at least for our purposes here for the time being, the connecting links between the Pizza Connection case and the P2 Lodge in Italy and the Iran-Contra scandal. Now, the main informant in the Pizza Connection case is a former mafioso named Tommaso Buscetta, last name B-U-S-C-E-T-T-A. Buscetta is an associate or former associate of, among others, Michele Sindona, a key mafioso who, as we've seen in many, many broadcasts, primarily... Radio Free America shows 18, 19, and 20, dealing with the shooting of the Pope, Michele Sendona is an associate of the infamous P2 Lodge based in Italy. 
The P2 Lodge is a Masonic Lodge which has served as a front, literally a crypto-fascist government, governing Italy and affecting also, through its lodges in these countries, the governments of Monaco, Brazil, and Argentina, as well as Uruguay. The main branch, though, is in Italy, and the P2 Lodge, involving, among others, Mafia associate of Tommaso Buscetta, Michele Sindona. The lodge is headed up by a fellow named Licio Gelli, a former SS Oberleutnant, according to David Yollop in his book In God's Name, and also an associate of, among others, Ronald Reagan and George Bush. This, according to information developed in Radio Free America shows 19, 20, and 21, also in Radio Free America shows 32 and 34. Haven't got the time to detail these connections past a point. Suffice it to say that Ronald Reagan, or at least Jelly, I should say, appears to have done a number of favors for Ronald Reagan, including apparently helping to get dirt on Billy Carter, Jimmy Carter's brother, through the Billy Gate Libya connection. This uh, surfaced in 1980 and helped deep six Jimmy Carter's presidential candidacy. Licio Gelli and some of his associates, no notably Francesco Pazienza, figure prominently in the background of the Billy Gate case. Licio Gelli was an honored guest at Ronald Reagan's inauguration, and according to information developed for us by Dave, our Italian translator, also an associate of George Bush, who helped Licio Gelli flee Italy when the disclosures about P2 broke in the spring of 1981. Now, one of Licio Gelli's associates in the P2, Michele Sindona. One of Michele Sindona's associates, in addition, in addition to the aforementioned Tommaso Buscetta, is the Gambino crime family. Now, uh, those of you who would like printed sources for this information, the P2 Sindona Buscetta Gambino connections can be documented in the book St. Peter's Banker by Luigi DeFonso, also in the book The Great Heroin Coup by Henrik Kruger. By the way, uh, one of the people, one of the P2 members who was involved with setting up the connections between Licio Gelli and American politicians is a fellow named Philip Guarino, whose name recently surfaced as being one of a number of doctrinaire fascists on the George Bush campaign staff by way of their position on the, the uh, Republican Party's Ethnic Heritage Council. Those connections are discussed in a, a miscellaneous archive show called The, the, the Nazis and Anti-Semites on George Bush's Campaign. Now, more about the Pizza Connection case, which, as we've seen, the recent bust uh, being announced on December 2nd of this of 1988 was an outgrowth of. We're calling this particular bust, by the way, Pizza Connection 4. Now, one of the most fascinating connections of the Pizza Connection case concerns the fact that uh, there is a link between another drug smuggling operation it linked in a big way with the Iran-Contra scandal and also the shooting of Pope John Paul II. That operation, which we detailed in great length in Radio Free America program number 20 and reprised in number 25, was called Stebomb. Stebomb was an arms-for-drug smuggling ring involving the national security establishments of the United States, West Germany, Italy, a number of East Bloc countries, and a number of Middle, uh, Middle Eastern countries as well. Its primary connections are not only to Western intelligence, but to specifically fascist elements within Western intelligence, and also to elements of what, thanks to the Christic Institute suit, has come to be known as the secret team. One of the most important connections in the Pizza Connection case was developed by the late May Brussel, the top political researcher in this field, and as uh, many longtime listeners to this broadcast know, a longtime colleague and friend of mine. In February of 1988, May, with the assistance of a great translation provided by Dave, our Italian translator, made a fabulous connection between the circumstances and individuals surrounding the shooting of Pope John Paul II in May of 1981 and people involved with the Pizza Connection bust. May discovered by using this Italian translation that Avni Yasser Musululu one of the main names mentioned in connection with the Pizza Connection, the Pizza Connection 1 revelation, which broke in 1984, was in fact an alias for Aral Chalik, one of the Grey Wolves, one of the members of the youth wing of the National Action Party, the Turkish Pan-Turkist and Neo-Nazi Party that we detailed in Radio Free America number 21, and that we also touched on in terms of analyzing the Pan-Turkist origins in Radio Free America 14, the first of our two shows about the World Anti-Communist League. Oral Chalik 
was an associate of Mehmet Ali Aja, the convicted attempted assassin of Pope John Paul II. One of the things that was revealed concerning Oral Chalik, according again to the Italian press, was that Oral Chalik was, among other things, the European distributor for the heroin coming out of the Golden Triangle in Southeast Asia that was being distributed by Sean Warlord Kun Sa, last name K-H-U-N, capital S-A. Kun Sa, in turn, has been revealed by a couple of different sources to have been connected, according to allegations, both by Bo Greitz, a former Green Beret who's done a lot of covert work, both in and out of uniform for the U.S. Uh, government, and also to information developed by the Christic Institute suit and also uh, independently floated by uh, Moff, or by Mafia, excuse me, Texas billionaire Freudian slip, Texas billionaire H. Ross Perot, linking names like Richard Armitage and Theodore Shackley, one of the main operatives in the secret team and the Iran-Contra scandal, according to many accounts, to Kun Sa. Now, in turn, an article which we covered in Radio Free America number 21, which in turn came from Europeo magazine of August 17th of 1985, links Theodore Shackley with Giuseppe Santavito, one of the key Italian intelligence officials involved with the P2 Lodge, also involved with, among other things, the Stebom Arms for Drugs ring, whose main paymaster, Bakir Chalink, was alleged to have been the paymaster for the shooting of Pope John Paul II. Bakir Chalink, a Turk, connected with Mehmet Ali Aja and also Oral Chalik, according to many accounts. Now, the Stebom Arms for Drugs ring itself has many connections to the secret team. We detailed its shipping of arms to the Contras and its shipping of weapons to Iran in Radio Free America shows number 20, 25. We came back to them in number 32 and in number 34 and the supplements to program number 34. These are the Radio Free America references. I can't detail all of the connections because it just would take too long. Suffice it to say that at the time in which, according to Europeo magazine, Theodore Shackley and Giuseppe Santavito of P2 and Stebaum fame hooked up in Italy, specifically in February of 81, the Vatican and the Kremlin were achieving a diplomatic rapprochement or a potential diplomatic rapprochement on a couple of different fronts. The first was that they were agreeing to avoid war in Poland, and they were also working to facilitate nuclear disarmament and peace in the Middle East, all of which, as we examined in Radio Free America number 21, conflicted for one reason or another with the aims of what the Christic Institute has referred to as the secret team. Again, I think perhaps it's a, a somewhat facile term, but it'll certainly save us time and space here, so I'm using it for that reason. It's, it's achieved a fair amount of public recognition at this point among progressive political circles, and, and for brevity's sake, I'm using that, given the massive scope of tonight's broadcast. Now, uh, in Pizza Connection 2, which we looked at in Radio Free America number 29, among other programs, we took a look at the combining of heroin smuggling and also cocaine smuggling, specifically cocaine from the Medellin cartel. The Medellin cartel, the Colombian cocaine cartel, which according to U.S. Justice and Drug Enforcement Authorities, accounts for most of the cocaine coming into the United States, was connected with the Iran-Contra scandal, according to information developed by the Christic Institute and a number of other independent media sources, we covered those in, among other programs, Radio Free America shows 29 and 30. Now, the Medellin cartel was linked in an article in the Washington Post from February of 1987 to Pizza Connection 2, in which mafia organized crime rings were distributing heroin and cocaine from pizza restaurants, this primarily in the Washington, D.C. region. Now, in March of 1988, Information was developed in which another case, alluded to in the article I read from December 2nd of 88, in which another case developing out of the Pizza Connection investigation, original Pizza Connection number one in our parlance from 1984, Pizza Connection two, the Washington heroin and cocaine case from February of 87, that's Pizza Connection two, number three from March of 88, in which cocaine from Latin America, as we hypothesized, Medellin cocaine was being exchanged for heroin coming in from Europe, specifically Italy. We hypothesized that perhaps Pizza Connection 3 might have entailed an exchange of Medellin cocaine for Golden Triangle or Golden Crescent heroin coming through the Stebom 
Network. As we took a look at again in Radio Free America's 2025, 32, and 34, there are a number of different hard ongoing connections between Stebaum and the Iran-Contra scandal. And again, the Stebaum Arms for Drugs Ring, a key element in the shooting of Pope John Paul II. So bear in mind here that... Uh, with all of these connections, oh, and before we uh, move on, it should be also mentioned that the current head of the FBI, former Judge William S. Sessions, is himself an interesting fellow with interesting connections to players on the same stage as the secret team. Judge Sessions presided over, among other things, the trial over the assassination of Judge John Wood. Judge John Wood assassinated in 1979, specifically in May of 79, had been looking into, among other things, the drug smuggling activities of an arms for drug smuggling ring called The Company, quote-unquote. Perhaps not coincidentally, that's the same nickname applied by agency veterans to the Central Intelligence Agency. The Company, which appears to have had considerable connections to the intelligence community and specifically, according to information developed in Radio Free America shows 31 and 32, actually, uh, 29, 30, 31, and 32, primarily 31 and 32, the company had connections to, among others, elements of the secret team, specifically the Triple Wilson gang, who we covered in Radio Free America number four originally, and that have cropped up in so many different connections, not only in connection with the shooting of the Pope in numbers 20 and 21, but also in a big way with the Iran-Contra scandal in numbers 30, 31, 32, and 34. Again, I do... To the scope here, I can't detail all of these particular connections. It should be noted that Judge John Wood uh, overturned, uh, or overlooked, I should say, a number of possible investigative leads in connection with the company. In turn, some of their associates with the uh, secret team, or what came to be known as the secret team, thereby apparently got off the hook. It should be noted, in particular, that uh, indications of government complicity in the drug trade were overlooked in connection with the assassination of Judge John Wood and a sometime associate of the company named William uh, James Atwood, I should say. James Atwood was a fellow involved with Oliver North's secret team in the Urea deal, which we will come back to later, one of the central and most important elements in the Iran-Contra scandal. 